And I'd just like to introduce Dr. Tumani Rucker Coker, who's from Mattel Children's Hospital and the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sorry to have walked in late. Um, I'm, uh, my name's Tamani Coker. I'm a general pediatrician and a health services researcher at UCLA. I was actually in another um, previous engagement in Santa Clarita, which is on the other side, as most of you might know, of Los Angeles. And when I got, I knew about this meeting ahead of time, and when I got the invitation to come speak here, um, I'm an optimist. So I said, well, that meeting's over at 2, so I can definitely be there by 3.30, no problem. <laughs> Um, so close, but no cigar there. Uh, so thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm uh, sorry that I couldn't spend the day with you all, but it looks like you had a wonderful agenda and some hopefully really good conversations taking place. Um, my, uh, my research focuses on um, delivery system design. I collaborate with community clinics and community practices that serve low-income communities in Los Angeles to design and investigate new and innovative ways to bring primary care and uh, preventive care services to children in these communities. Uh, we focus on designing innovative models for preventive care. Uh, one example of these models is a project ongoing is using a parent coach uh, at every preventive care visit with families. And the parent coach uh, basically does a lot of the uh, linkages and referrals that you all have been ta talking about today and provides a lot of education right there at the visit. Um, so it's responsible for some of the things that have been mentioned already by the panel, a panelist, things like uh, making those connections to the schools that really matter and bridging those gaps. Um, we also focus, we, have a, we focus on telehealth uh, to bring mental health services into community clinics so that uh, parents can avoid the stigma attached to going to a mental health clinic and they can go right back to their primary care doctor but still receive those mental health services. Uh, and then a lot of the research also focuses on socioeconomic disparities, addressing socioeconomic disparities in care for children. So I see patients at, at UCLA, I teach uh, residents and medical students. And I think my perspective that I'll bring on um, here is really about how preventive care visits for children um, can be linked to the various resources, community agencies, and just array of professionals and services that are really essential to a healthy child development in zero to eight. Um, I want to start off by just how I kind of got to this work. Uh, I have three kids, uh, twin boys who are eight, a baby girl that's two. And before I had the kids, my primary care or preventive care visits, you know, I followed the guidelines. I, I had my list of things that I wanted the parents to know about. Um, I had assessments that I wanted to get done and sort of, you know, I, I, I followed the rules and I, and I gave the recommendations as they are supposed to be given. And then I had twins. And I thought, what? Why did I ever say that to parents with a straight face? And so I got to see a little bit. And you know, I was already a pediatrician at the time. Um, I was educated. I had a salary. I, I had a husband who was also a partner in parenting. And it was still really hard. So I could only imagine, and really only imagine, what it's like for some of my patients that don't have any of those things, um, but still have the children to take care of. And all the stress and not having those things like resources and full-time work um, bring. So, you know, I think at that point I began to realize, as many others have in the field, that the way that we structure preventive care visits really is just not ideal in meeting needs of families um, that have in low-income communities and stressful situations, these needs just can't be met in that one-on-one -on -one, traditional 15-minute visit with a physician. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics, if I just focus on the zero to eight, uh, the recommendation and the schedule, um, even for CH CHDP, is that children receive 16 preventive care visits during those, that age group. And for children who are not school age yet, the pediatrician 
or family doc or nurse practitioner, that might be the only professional that they come into contact with before they start preschool. So it's really um, a big responsibility um, on these preventive care visits to address those, to make that assessment, address those needs, and connect the families to, what, to the resources that they need. So our visits and preventive, these preventive care visits are really an important tool to identify and address these important social, developmental, behavioral, and health issues that can have lasting impact on that child as they grow to be an adult. Um, and in order to take full advantage of this opportunity, we really have to build these linkages um, between uh, various resources and services for the visits. So in addition to, I want to talk a little bit about the preventive care visit and what we do and where I think the linkages are and where they um, need to be. Um, in addition to the medical things that happen in the well child visit, preventive care visit, checkup, whatever you want to call it, um, we have to address the key determinants of child health and well-being, and a lot of those are going to be non-medical. They just are. Um, we're talking about things like addressing um, the different things related to poverty, uh, poor educational outcomes, unhealthy social and physical environments, unhealthy lifestyle choices. Those are all the things that really are about the preventive care visit, but those are the things that sometimes get left out at the preventive care visit. Um, so parents will come in, they'll get in these visits, their physical examination of the child, immunizations and lab screening, and those are the national guidelines for preventive care visits. But in addition to that, every visit is to have three other things I want to tell you about and then we'll talk about those are where we have these, this need for linkages and um, other professionals. So anticipatory guidance, and that's basically like guidance and education. So every visit, uh, national guidelines, really should talk about, uh, have anticipatory guidance in there. And what that is, is um, education and guidance on a variety of topics that's age specific. So things like uh, feeding, sleeping, when you talk about infancy, um, injury prevention, um, all throughout childhood. And um, when we look at studies of preventive care visits nationally, we know that this is one area where there's lots of unmet need in care. So parents say that they needed more information on a topic and would have liked to get it, but they didn't get it. So ways to address this are people that can be involved in the preventive care visit and in different models are involved. Um, the first would be health educators, because they're going to be able to spend more time with the family to really talk about some of these things. Um, send uh, referrals to places that have group classes, things like uh, cooking classes some clinics are now um, doing, or community centers will have cooking classes on healthy eating. So if I have uh, a family that has a four and a six-year-old, and both are obese, you know, I can, we just don't have the uh, insurance is not going to cover nutritionist, but can I send them someplace in the community where they're doing healthy cooking classes so the parent can kind of understand within their cultural um, uh, palate how to make healthy foods. Um, being able to have some places to send kids for physical activity, especially in environments where there's a lot of neighborhood violence. So safe places where they can have physical activity and not just the, depend on the parents to make that up when maybe they haven't done it themselves. Breastfeeding support groups, mommy and me groups that can provide a, some social support for isolated parents, uh, parenting classes, all those things are sort of in the realm of what we're calling anticipatory guidance and education that we just can't do on our own um, as clinicians. Uh, the second big part of every visit should be psychosocial screening and services. So psychosocial screening, being able to assess what are the issues that are um, not only related to the child but to the family, things like homelessness, food insecurity, intimate partner violence, neighborhood violence, maternal depression. These are the kind of things that we tell the residents and students, if you don't ask, you will never know. Um, if you do ask, you might not get, you might not know, but then there's your chance. If you don't ask, there's no way you're gonna know. Because it's one, if you look at all the services, and you, we've done some interviews with parents, qualitative studies, they don't even know that that's part of what we're supposed to do. So why would they tell us? I've been through a whole visit with a parent 
And at the end, I find out they're living in the car. And, you know, you feel like, wow, I can't believe I talked about, uh, I don't know, adding iron to the diet. And they don't have a place to live. Um, but having one reason why clinicians aren't asking the question sometimes is because they don't have any place, they don't, they don't have anything to do with that. And that's not the best answer, but if we can address those things and give people resources, those are some of the things. So for our parent coach in that, in those clinics that use a parent coach, um, she has collaborated with the agencies in the community homeless shelter in the community, the, she has social services. All the services that are needed, she's made the connections with, she keeps them up to date so that when that comes up, there's a place to send the parent and a way to follow up with them. Um, other uh, kind of psychosocial needs for uh, referrals would be mental health clinics. I talked a little bit about the telehealth program, legal aid, um, mental health, um, for the family as well as a child, financial literacy, all those kinds of things are, are very important. And then the third big thing in the last couple minutes is developmental and behavioral services. And this is um, obviously a very important topic to this group. Um, you know, it, the short is that we're, there are national guidelines to do structured developmental screening for developmental delay and for autism at specific age, uh, at a periodicity during well child care, when national studies show that about 20% of families get that at their, well, at their preventive care visit, and that's abysmal. Uh, so really finding ways to first get the screening in the office in a way that every child gets a screening, uh, and then having the connections when the screening becomes positive. It's another time when if you don't know what you're going to do when you find a positive result, you're less likely to look for that positive result. So regional center making those collaborations, uh, early education services, Head Start, early Head Start. Some clinics will have one of the clinics that we're working with now, uh, FQHC, a federally qualified health center, has early Head Start right next door. So we're working with them so that um, the educators are shared between the uh, centers. Um, being able to connect with the preschools in the area as well as the schools, uh, LAUSD, um, we, are, we are working with, um, they have wellness centers now at a few of the school sites in LAUSD, and we're doing an evaluation for them on a new project called um, uh, Early Linkage to Wellness, and it's a way to improve the services for zero to five. Uh, and then lastly, there's some uh, things, uh, being able to connect families to low-cost um, daycare and finding those resources. So some of the work uh, that we're continuing to look at are um, new models for preventive care, including parent coaches, using group model care, where parents come in a group uh, rather than a one-on-one, -on -one, so really taking that one-on-one -on -one visit and changing it entirely so that parents can have a support group and learn from each other, and then this kind of idea of a one-stop shopping model for federally qualified health centers. Thank you. <laughs>